Good afternoon. My name is Pastor Freddy L. Beth, the Living Word Ministry over here in West Beverly, Indiana. I would like to talk to you today for a brief period here on the Christian struggle. If I was to ask you a question, what is the one main thing that most Christians struggle with, what do you think your answer would be? We will soon find out in the teaching here as I bring it forth to you. But let us have a word of prayer before we begin. Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you, dear Father, for this beautiful afternoon. I thank you for all the blessings and the glory is yours, Father. We give you praise. And I thank you for the strength and our health and all the things that you daily bestow upon us. The blessings are new each morning. I give you praise, Father. I ask your anointing now on your servant here as I minister your word that it will bring grace to the hearer. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, in Romans chapter 6, if you have your Bible, if you don't, it doesn't matter, you can follow along with me, but sometimes you should, most of the time, matter of fact, you should always have your Bible. If someone is teaching, you should have your Bible to follow along to make sure that they are teaching what the scriptures say, and not their, something out of their head or what they feel is right. But on this subject, the struggle of the Christian, or the believer, in other words. Sadly, I, I, you know, when I'd ask somebody this question, they would probably give all kinds of answers. But the real answer is the flesh. And as long as you're in this human body, there's going to be a struggle. In other words, when you get saved, you just, it's not going to be a bed of roses from there on. You have to fight the good fight of faith. And we have an adversary, Satan, who is going to attack us, and we have to put on the whole armor of God, like over Ephesians 6, in order to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now that word wiles means his deception and cunning craftiness, and that's what he uses all the time. He's a liar and a deceiver, and he gets Christians to swallow a lot of things because they don't know the word. But if you notice, when Jesus was in the wilderness, you can read that in Matthew chapter 4 and Mark chapter 4 of that account, he didn't mess with the enemy. Every time the enemy would ask him something or would say, do this, he would say, it is written. In other words, it's written in the word of God. I only do what I hear my father say and what he tells me to do. And in John chapter 10, Jesus said, my sheep, they know my voice and they will hear me. And a stranger, they will not listen to me. See, that, that develops into a believer as they acknowledge the word of God in their heart and begin to grow with the word of God. You know, there's times you're not going to have a Bible with you, literally carrying it around. You should have the Bible hid within your heart. David, the psalmist, in Psalm 119.11, he said, Thy word, Lord, have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. So if you hide the word in your heart, you're less apt to sin with your mouth and with your actions. All right, I want to read some scriptures here. I want to start out in Romans chapter 6. We're going to do a little reading here, starting in verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Paul's asking this question because a lot of believers believe that once they're saved by grace, they can have a license, they can go ahead and just sin because grace has it covered. Because the Bible says where sin does abound, grace does much more abound. Well, that is true, but we're not given a license just to practice sin. If we go over into 1 John, it talks about he that sinneth is of the devil. In other words, he that practiced sin is still sinning every day, doing the same things that he did before his conversion. I put a question mark, is he really saved? Because if you're a new creature, like in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, then therefore if any man be in Christ, he notes that term, in Christ, he's a new creature, a new creation. Old things are passed away. And behold, all things are become new, brand new. Not a renovation. God doesn't save you in your sin. He saves you from sin. Amen. The blood of Jesus cleanses you from all unrighteousness, not just a little bit. You can't get half saved, part saved, order saved. You're either saved or you're not. You're either a saint or you're an angel. You're one or the other. You, you can't be both. And sadly, a lot of saints of God, they, who profess to be saints of God, 
still live after the flesh and the dictates of the flesh and the animal appetites within them because they haven't trained their body to obey their spirit and they haven't got this mind renewed to the word of God. You see, we find that over in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Chapter, chapter 12, verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. See, not a dead sacrifice. A living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable unto God. Acceptable to who? Not your neighbor. Not even yourself. But unto God. And he says, which, which is your reasonable service. In other words, that's saying what at least you could do as a believer. Give your heart, your life, your body, and everything to the Lord. Say. You once bore sin, now put on righteousness. Sin has died. The old nature is crucified with Christ on the cross. If you haven't been to the cross, then you haven't got the new nature. I'm sorry, you're not born. You don't just come and get some religion, some religion and think you're saved. Religion can't save anyone. Matter of fact, religion has probably placed a lot of people in hell through deception. And that's really sad. Satan has used that tool to take a lot of people to hell. If they thought they were all right, if they thought they were ready, but they were only religious. Jesus said, except your righteousness exceed that of the Pharisees and scribes, you will perish. In other words, he's saying, you better get real salvation, and that is in me, and only me. Amen? John chapter 14, verse 6. Again, Jesus said, No man comes to the Father, but by me. That means through me. For I am the way, the truth, and the life. See? Not a way, a truth, and a life. Like Oprah Winfrey, she's trying to say many ways to God. You know, we, we can have many ways to find Jesus. No, there's only one way. And the Father has to draw the person through the Holy Spirit to Jesus in order to get saved. And sadly, people don't even understand simple salvation. That's why they need preachers and teachers to teach them the truth of the word. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, getting back to our text in here I, on Romans 6, I didn't want to bear off of that too much, but I just felt in the spirit I had to explain this as I'm teaching. Paul asks this question, should we continue in sin? No, 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 no. God forbid, see, the very next part of verse 2, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? From there on. Now, that don't mean you're going to be absolutely, totally perfect. You're never going to slip and make a mistake or never sin again. If you slip and sin and fall over in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, if any man sin, beloved, we have an advocate with the Father. That's an attorney, what that word means. An attorney with the Father. Jesus Christ, the right. Who goes before the Father and intercedes for us. The Bible says if we'll confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of them again. And cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now again, that doesn't give you a license to go and sin and sin and sin over and over. See, like the Catholics. They think they can go into a confession booth and confess before a man their sins, and it'll be all right. They can sin all week long, drink wine, do whatever they want to do, crowds, and do those fleshly things and appetites, like I said, of the flesh, and then go into a confessional and confess this before a man. First of all, that man can't forgive you sin. You have to come to Jesus Christ, the only advocate between the Father and us. See? Jesus tore down that veil which kept man out. The law, the law of Moses and everything kept man from entering into the Holy of Holies and into the very presence of God. They could only send a high priest in at that time who had went through the rituals and through the acceptance of God. And they tied a rope around his right leg and he went into the Holy of Holies and sprinkled blood upon the altar and everything for the sins. That's called atonement. The, the, the blood of bulls and goats lambs or whatever. Those were all types of the Christ who was coming, who removed sin from us and literally destroyed sin. But we have to continue in Christ to be redeemed from the curse of the law and sin. Amen. So we can see that God says, no, I forbid that you continue or practice 
sin. You just can't. It's like somebody walking around. I'll give you an example. If somebody tells you, I've quit smoking, and the next 10 minutes you see them over there lighting up a cigarette, uh, I think they lie. And they still have that addiction and have it, right? Now, in their mind, they can think they quit, but you got to have a literal manifestation of the deliverance in your body. And there's where a lot of people fail with these addictions. They try, but they don't let God give them the strength to deliver them from the addiction in the habit. Amen. All right. So God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin, notice that term, we're dead to it. Sin's dormant now, it's killed. Was crucified, nailed to the cross. Jesus took our sins and nailed them to that cross at Calvary. Praise God and deliver. We're dead. We're dead to sin and live any longer than it. Now, verse three. Know you not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into His death? And that's not talking about water baptism. There's a lot of people they get confused there and they mix that up. That's talking about the Holy Spirit baptizing us. The believer into the body of Christ by faith. So, as we receive Jesus, then we become his child. John chapter 1, verse 12. For as many as receive him, to them, to them give he the power to become what? Sons of God, that means children of God. Or the authority and the ability to live in that righteousness of Christ as well. Now in 2 Corinthians 5 21, it says, He that knew no sin. Jesus, speaking of Jesus, became sin. That means he took our sins on himself on the cross. He became sin that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ, in him. In other words, he took our sin and gave us his righteousness. Now that's a wonderful trade. And none of us deserve it. See, we received it by grace, for by grace are we saved. That's in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, and not of works. See that? Lest any man should boast. And we got people that are religious today who are always trying to work their way to God. And they crawl back under the law and the bondage of the law. The law can't save you. The law is a tutor. It's, this Bible is like a mirror. It's a mirror of God's perfection. And when we look into the perfect law of liberty, it's called, then we see that we fall very short. Of God's expectation for the law. But through Christ, when we come through Jesus, then we can meet those expectations because Jesus has already done that at Calvary. Because he's absolutely perfect. He was the perfect sacrifice. Amen. No sin, perfect, pure, and absolutely acceptable of God. And the only one that would have been able to redeem us from sin. Muhammad couldn't save you. Buddha can't save you. None of these religions are going to save you. That makes you wonder why in the world people are following all these religions. Because of ignorance, spiritual ignorance they do not understand. Uh, and some will read their Quran or read whatever they have. And people have taught them this. And say that Muhammad, Muhammad didn't die for your sins. He didn't shed a drop of blood for you at all. Neither did Buddha. So are you going to trust your life to a person? And by the way, their bones and stuff are still in their grave. So... You know, and the God that they serve, like Muhammad, that's Allah, that's a moon God, that's, that's a false God, that's even a real God. You know, that makes a lot of Muslims mad, you tell them. They hate Christians and Jews anyway, and they want to annihilate us. But the word of God is the truth. Jesus said, my words, they are truth and life and spirit. And they, you know, the word and the spirit are one, and they agree. You notice our Bible doesn't teach us to take a sword and cut somebody's head off if they don't agree with the word. Well, the Quran teaches them to kill everyone that doesn't accept the Quran. They're considered infidels and must be crucified or their heads cut off. They won't accept Allah or the Quran. Now, what kind of religion? I wouldn't follow that. <laughs> There's no love there. God is love. 1 John 4 8. You don't tell us to fly into buildings and kill people. Come on, let's understand the difference between real salvation in Christ and nonsense or religion made of man and Satan, doctrines of devils and doctrines of men. 
Amen. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 says, Know ye this, the Spirit speaks expressively that in the latter time, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils or demons. You understand that? Amen. That's what's going on right now. If we're being seduced by the enemy through our mind. But if we are true believers in Christ and walk after the Spirit, and we're not subject to this world. We're not subject to these temptations. We're not subject to all this nonsense and false teaching. You see, you'll know the truth. The Bible says you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You want to be free? Trust God's word. Get God's word into you. And he said, my spirit will always lead you in the truth. As a matter of fact, that's one of the names of the Holy Spirit, isn't it? The spirit of truth. He shall guide you in these last days. The Bible says, you know, if it's possible, even the very elect, that's the believers and the Jews, would be deceived if not for the Holy Spirit. Praise God. You see, you have the Holy Spirit abiding and living in you. And you're not going to listen to those lies. You're not going to listen to those false voices that are going to be ringing out there. Amen? Praise God. Amen. So, this baptism is talking about is we're baptized as believers into the body of Christ. We're sealed right then. So the day of redemption of our body, we're sealed in the body as, as believers. Our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life at that point. Now we do need to get baptized in water because that's an ordinance that we should follow after the obedience of Christ. Because he was baptized in water. And again, that symbolizes the grave lowering down under the water and being raised up in newness of life. Right? There's that new creature again walking after the Spirit and after the Word of God. Amen. Now verse 4, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life, which I just said there. Now verse 5, if we've been planted together in his likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. I'm going to apologize for that. Again, that just knocks religion right in the head right there. You see, people, they think water baptism save you, but it wasn't. Water baptism won't save you. I hope that that's going to disappoint a lot of religious people. Right there. It's, an, it's an ordinance that we should obey and follow, but it has nothing really to do with the salvation. The washing and the regenerating is the word of God that comes into your heart. If you haven't had that washing and regenerating from the Holy Spirit, you can go to a pool of water, I don't care where it is, and you can go down a dry center and come up a wet one. Because if you haven't had a change of heart, change of mind, and change of direction, then you haven't repented. You haven't truly repented of your sin and had a new change of heart and life with God. That's the new birth that Jesus talked about in John chapter 3. When Nicodemus came to him at night for fear of the Jews. And he said, Master, I know that thou art come from God, because no man can do these mighty works and miracles that you do. And Jesus didn't start right there immediately talking about miracles. He comes right back at Nicodemus and says, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say, you accept the man be born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, that water baptism, the water birth, is that first birth. Again, it's not talking about water baptism, it's talking about you being born into a fleshly body, into life. And then the spirit birth, that's the second one. Now, I said this a lot. I'm going to repeat it again. If you're born once, you die twice. If you're born twice, you're only going to die once. You understand what I mean there? If you only have the first birth, you never receive Christ, you're going to die the second death, which is eternal separation from God in the lake of fire. But if you've been born twice, you will not appear at the white throne. It's for judgment. You'll be on the right hand as sheep with God, and you've already been judged in Calvary. You have a new life. See, the white throne judgment is for non-believers. They won't be caught up to that until the very end you know, of the millennium. God will call them out of the graves and they will get their bodies, a glorified body, but they'll be judged at the white throne. All the dead in hell will be called up, all out of the seas and wherever wherever the bodies are, and the people that have not been regenerated and have received Christ will be judged at that point and sadly thrown into the lake of fire. 
God doesn't look forward to that day, so he does not take pleasure in throwing any human beings into the lake of fire. That lake of fire was created for Satan and his fallen angels, not for man. So right now, hell's brimming over with men. Isn't that sad? It's brimming over because they had religion, but they didn't have any understanding. They didn't have a new heart for Christ. See, Christ is that bridge. I'm going to take a picture of the cross over the pits of hell into eternity. That's our bridge. And there is no other way to enter into eternity except through Christ. Again, I told you, no man comes to the Father except by me. Acts 4.12 says, No other name under heaven, therefore, given by men, where we must be saved through Jesus Christ. There is no other name. Not Muhammad, not Peter, like I said. None of those other names. Only Jesus Christ. Well, that's dogmatic, Fred. That's right. But it's Bible. And it's true. And I stake my life and my eternal salvation upon that. What are you trusting in today? Are you trusting in the Muslim religion? Are you trusting in Catholicism to save you, like catechism? You'll be lost. You will split hell wide open. I don't mean to offend Catholics or Muslims or anybody, but I'm telling you, religion is worthless. They're just like Seven Day Adventists, that's religion. Mormons, that's religion. Jehovah Witnesses, that's religion. All of that will not save you. That's man made religion. Denomination, which means division. And they're even being added daily. Now, we got new denominations coming in all the time. It's sad. The church needs to get back to the power of God in Acts chapter 2 of the book of Acts. We need to get in there and study that book and live that life like the early church did. We are still that church. We're going to finish the book of Acts. God's going to do mighty feats and miracles at our hands if we will obey him and be a yielded vessel and a clean vessel. That's all God requires. He don't require an educated vessel with a lot of college degrees and all that. God's not looking for that. He's looking for someone that will obey him. And then he'll pour the spirit of God out on that vessel and use that vessel mightily for his glory. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. Now, verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified, you heard me use that word with him, that the body of sin might be what? Destroyed. That henceforth, and that word again means from there on, we should not serve sin. See the word serve? You can't, you can't be a child of God, profess to be a child of God, just continue to serve your flesh and serve all the things that you once did before. There's something wrong with your salvation. You might want to check and see if you are really saved. Amen. See, a lot of people say a sinner's prayer, and they use it like a catch-all, and I go like a fire escape, Jesus. Okay, Lord, I, I got caught here on the sin. Please forgive me. But in their heart, they really have no true intention to really live for God. I've seen them go to the altar and ball tears. I mean, great big alligator tears. You never see the people again. They're right back out into the world. Because they were false converts. They didn't have real, true conversion in Christ. You hear people say, how many converts you get in the church? It ain't about the converts. It's about true salvation and repentance. And then those people need to be taught and trained and become disciples of Christ. The disciple is a disciplined believer who walks after the Spirit and doesn't yield to the flesh. I didn't say he wouldn't make mistakes again. We're going to make this, as long as we're in this body, we got a battle. That's the title of this message, the struggle of the Christian. The struggle of the Christian. Jesus didn't promise us road garden, but he did say, I will be with you. In this world, he said, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I've overcome the world. In other words, he's with us, and he will help us through all these trials and tests. Amen? Praise God. Hallelujah. I wouldn't live this life without Jesus. I wouldn't want to be here on this planet without Jesus. I'm glad for rapture. There's a lot of people fighting over that issue. Well, the word rapture ain't in the Bible. I don't even want to go into that. It's just sad that they can't believe God's word and the simple truth. That's just, to me, that's calling God a liar. Yet they'll believe man's doctrines and man's teachings and they twist the word. It's like Satan will take some of the word and twist it. 
We don't use a full truth, we use a half truth. Alright. Verse 9, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. So if it doesn't have dominion over him, it doesn't have dominion over us. And we're talking about the death curse of sentence, sin. Christ destroyed that in Calvary. Praise God. For death, hell, sin, and the grave, he took the victory. Praise God. He brought back the keys of the kingdom to us. What are the keys of the kingdom? All of God's word. How to live a holy and righteous and true life in the spirit after the word. Alright, verse 10, For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, be that dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, this house of clay. Don't let this thing dictate to you, oh, I feel sick today we yield to that and say I'm not that saying the feelings aren't real I'm not saying that sickness isn't real I'm saying you've got to learn to grow in the spirit of God and the power of his word and get your confession lined up with his word and rebuke that negative report that comes and that anything that exalts itself against the word of God and God will bring healing and deliverance dependent upon your faith and how strong you are is how fast that deliverance comes and Isaiah says, while they're yet calling all the lambs, sometimes you could just, you start living for the Lord, walking in the Spirit where you should, you don't even have to really say much. It's just that you just take authority up against that immediately and bring every thought into captivity, like in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 talks about, through the obedience of Christ. We've got to get control over our minds and our bodies. They didn't get saved. Your soul didn't get saved. Your body didn't get saved. Your spirit man got saved. Praise God. He's the one that's strong. The Spirit is developing every day, renewing every day. The Bible says, but the outer man is perishing every day. We have to keep up maintenance on his body as well. But also we have to have maintenance on our spirit man, and that's the word of God right here. We've got to have the word in us. You know, and guiding us and directing us, showing us every move and thing that we should do. I just wonder sometimes if the children of God, and I'm talking about myself here as well, if we would listen to that small, still voice, we wouldn't have near the problems that we have. And we would have great victories and many other wonderful things happening in our life because God will lead us into victory through His Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Verse 13, neither yield you your members, that means your hands, your eyes, your ears, can't sit in front of the boot tube and Sucking a bunch of garbage, watching all the murder and the blood on there and the sex and all that stuff. You didn't think God's going to be a, a blessing? That God's going to use you? No, because you're all corrupt in your mind. You've polluted it. These ear gates and eye gates, they're not garbage pails to take in anything that just flops along. People sit and watch television all the time and just suck in the nasty trash. Do you not know that you're grieving the Holy Ghost there? You're grieving the Holy Spirit in your I'm not saying you can't watch television. There's good programming and stuff that's fairly clean. But again, you don't want to get all wrapped up in television. Very little word and a whole lot of TV. You know, the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth's going to speak. So if you're watching Gilligan's Island all the time, which is funny and everything, but that's all you're going to know is Gilligan's Island. Or if you're watching sports, football, you can name all the team members and everything, but you can't even quote one scripture. What's wrong with that? Means your priority is out of whack. See, you're born again, washed in the blood, but you're not walking after the Spirit and the obedience of Christ. All right. Neither yield your members the instruments of unrighteousness and sin, but yield yourself unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. See that word instrument? Did you know that? We, can, we have to be God's mouthpiece. We have to be God's eyes looking in love and compassion. We can be a hearing ear of compassion. A lot of times if we just be quiet and listen, we can hear the, the troubles that people have. You know, begin to share things with you and pray about them. You 
just be careful when people start revealing their secrets to you. It's not for you to go blab them all over the countryside. You've got to keep a lot of things in confidence between you and them and God. If they've trusted you that much, that means that they depend on you and expect a lot from you. And they will admire you and come more to you once they know they can trust you. But sadly, a lot of people like to gossip. You know what so-and-so told me? I can't believe it. See, right away, you're in the place, but, and you're in the wrong place, by the way. You're doing things you should. Now, verse 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, see, but under grace. Remember, we talked about that earlier. So we're saved by grace, through faith, and not of ourselves. Not of ourselves. In other words, you can't just mentally think for yourself. You just say, well, I believe in God. I believe in God. That makes me automatically saved. No, it doesn't. The Bible says, except you repent, you shall likewise perish in your sin. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. For the preaching of the gospel to them which are perishing is foolish. But to us who believe, it is the power of God. Salvation. Yeah. Romans 1 6 Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone, here it is, that believeth, to the Jew first, and then to the Greek, because that means the same time. So there you have it. Just simple. You have people try to put uh, laws, the burden all on the salvation, and tell people they have to do certain things to be saved. Recite certain things like in the catechism and all that, line up works. See, men's works. And that's sad. That's religion, folks. Because that will deceive you and destroy you. Now, verse 15. What then shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? That's another question. Does God forbid? God forbids that. You're saved by His precious grace. And grace, by the way, means an unmerited gift. God, and God give us the gift of salvation through His Son Jesus. There's no other way that we can truly be saved except through His Son. And it's a precious free gift that cost God dearly. His Son had to die on, on the cross. That's part of God. That's part of God that died on Calvary. And then the Father and the Spirit raised Him back up from the dead. He had that assurance and promise and authority of Himself as well. He said, destroy this temple, and in three days, I'll raise it up. And they in their spiritual, the religious ignorance, the Pharisees and scribes, they said, it took 40 years or better to build this temple, and you're going to raise it up. They thought he was talking about the building. You see, people today are so spiritually ignorant in the same way. You've got to understand when you're talking to them, you just can't assume that everybody understands what you're saying. Because if the Holy Spirit hasn't illuminated their uh, eyes and enlighten their eyes of understanding. They can't understand what you're saying. That's why so many are having trouble. And then they'll say, I can't understand that King James. That's not the King James that you're talking about. It's that you need the Holy Spirit to open your eyes of understanding so you can understand the passage. So right away they go and buy another translation, which is more plain English, but sadly they be watered down the scripture and change something. you got to be careful. I stay with the King James. I teach nothing but King James. Now I use commentaries and other uh, books that are to authors who have done a lot of study and research and everything. Yeah, but you're not going to see an NIV in my house because I don't I don't like that translation. They've literally taken passages, complete passages out of it. It's called the New International Version. It ought to be called the New International Perversion. God's word. I'm sorry. Got a one in your house? I'm sorry, that that offends you. That's because that religion is rising up in you. That shows you that you're possibly religious right there. Because you see, the word of God, you won't be offended by the word of God. Psalm 119, 165, Great peace has they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. They're in love with God's word. And nothing's gonna offend them because they know the truth of the word. So therefore, somebody talking about an NIV. Explaining them that it's not a good translation. That shouldn't offend you. That ought to help you say, whoa, I, maybe I need to change my Bible. Just like your church you're in, too. 
If it's not preaching the full gospel, if it's not preaching the truth of God's word, if it's downgrading the scriptures and saying, like the baptism of the Holy Spirit was the evidence of speaking in tongues, and they're saying that's of the devil or all that, you better get out of that church. For this poison, it'll take you down. Amen. I'm sorry, this is probably hard for some religious heads to take this, but this message is the truth. And if you're a struggling Christian today, you need to find out why, if that struggle is really, really great, and you have such great temptation on it, like to take a drink again, or to get back on cigarettes, or drugs, or porn, or whatever you're into, then you need to examine yourself, because there's something wrong there. I didn't say you wasn't saved. Satan will hit the, the baby Christian real quick, and try to drag him right back into the sin. That's exactly what he wants to do. Now, now, verse 16 says, Know you not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death, because the way you just gave us death. Romans 6 23, for the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ the Lord. Whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. So, being obedient to God's word and his will, what's it going to lead you to? More righteousness to God. And by the way, that word righteous means right standing with the Father. We've been placed into right standing and position with the Lord through the precious shed blood of His Son Jesus. We are made holy and righteous in Him. You have become the very righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I quoted that to you earlier out of 2 Corinthians 5 21. And He will do no sin who came to sin, that we might become the righteousness. In him. That's in him. Not our own self righteousness. We have no righteousness in our own. The best that we can do, like the Bible says, is like filthy rags in the sight of God. That means like a menstrual rag. You've got to bring that up to God and say, Here, I've, I've done all these mighty works. Remember what Jesus said in that day? He said, I, He said, He's a slothful and wicked servant. I don't know you. Depart from me. I never even knew you. Even if you've been following a religion, you've been following the church, men's doctrines, thinking that's all right. Well, my church teaches this, brother, and I'm going to follow it. Well, it better be lined up with the Word of God, or you better run away from it. Amen. I can't warn you enough in that area. I mean, but if, if you have made up your mind to follow whatever your pastor is teaching, if he's not teaching the Word, you need to approach him in love, privately, not open up in front of all the congregation. Say, can you explain to me what you thought up there? And if he re rejects you and rebels and says, No, I don't think you have, you don't need to know that. I don't have, I don't have to explain myself to you. That's when I would leave. Because if he's a true man of God and loves the Lord, he's going to take care of the sheep. He's going to feed them. He won't be a hireling in there just for the money and the power and the power trip or whatever he wants. He'll want to see those sheep grow up and strong in the Lord. Now verse 18 says, being then made free from sin, you become the servants of righteousness. See, you're no longer serving sin. You start to serve righteousness. Amen. Now, verse 19, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh, or the weakness of your flesh. What that means. For as you have yielded your members servants unto uncleanness, and that means sin, and then unto iniquity, that's lawlessness. Unto iniquity, even so now you will yield your member of servants to righteousness unto holiness. So when you begin to walk in the righteousness of God, it's going to lead you into his holiness. In other words, you're going to get more like God. You're going to become more holy. And not holier than thou, like a religious person. They walk around with their head up in the air and everything and say, you know, I'm glad I don't do what you do. <sighs> See, that's, that's the wrong frame of mind and not right. That's a religious mind talking there. None of us have any righteousness in ourselves. Only because of what Christ has done will we last. And one life will soon be passed, and only what's done for Christ will last. All right. All right, now verse 19, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. We read that. 
verse 20, for when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. In other words, the sinner does what he does best, he sins. He's not looking out to be righteous. He's not saying, I'm going to go to church today. No, that's not even on his mind. And not the church itself is going to save you or make you any holier. You know. But when you hear God's word, Romans 10, 17, you know, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the more you hear the word and hear the word, the more it's going to bring faith, and faith will change your life. Faith will bring you towards God and towards the truth of his word. And then into repentance, you see a godly sorrow works repentance, and earthly sorrow works death. Judas hung himself. He didn't have a godly sorrow. Peter wept bitterly. He had a godly sorrow. He acknowledged where he was. He said, Lord, forgive me. Jesus came in and cleansed him. He received eternal life. Amen. Now verse 24, when we were sinners, servants of sin, you were free from the righteousness. Now verse 21, what fruit had you when in those things? Whereof ye are now ashamed, for the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin, there it is again, and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness, and the end the end result of everlasting life. Amen. For the wages of sin is death, and the poor death means it, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Who's it through? Jesus Christ our Lord. No one Jesus. Now in, in chapter 7 here, I don't know whether you want to go into all of this or not, but it talks about, Paul's talking about himself basically, he's talking about the struggle. And I, I'm going to start in verse, let's see, yeah. verse 7 here, of chapter 7, what shall we say then, is it the law of sin? God forbid, no, the, the law is not sin. I told you the law is like a mirror, it's a tutor, to teach you and lead you to Calvary. Nay, if I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known the lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. So people don't know what's right or wrong a lot of times unless the law reveals it to them. Say, Dr. Law, I taught a message one time, Dr. Law and Dr. Grace. Dr. Law will reveal your sins, but you've got to go to the surgeon, Dr. Grace, to get deliverance from them. That's Jesus. You've got to go into the, the surgical room, operating room, get on the table, and the Lord Jesus has to give you a new heart. Otherwise, you're going to die of terminal disease called sin. And it's going to be eternal wages of death. Right. Verse 8, but sin taking occasion by the commandment brought in me all manner of conspicuous. For without the law, sin was dead. In other words, again, you didn't know it. You didn't recognize that you were a sinner. I've, I've asked people, were you saved? And they said, saved from what? They didn't even know that they were lost. So you got to find First thing, first step of getting saved is to find, to recognize that you're lost and away from God and undone, and that you are a sinner. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. People are going to tell you they haven't sinned, but right there that verse proves that we are all sinners. Well, you know, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. I believe that's all of us, you and I, the ungodly. In other words, he came in the dispensation of time exactly ordered of the Father to die on that cross perfectly for our sins at that perfect timing. He redeemed us, and that means to buy back. He redeemed us from the curse of the law and sin. Now, verse 9, for I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came by the law, sin revived and I died. In other words, he acknowledged the sin in his life. They also think that he was without God. Now verse 10, in the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. In other words, the law, the letter killeth. It doesn't bring life. It just shows you where you are. Grace brings life. Moses delivered the law. And Christ brought grace. He brought grace to the church. To the believer. Now verse 11, for sin taking occasion, by the commandment to deceive me, and by it slew me. 
then we'll slay you. Now, the wages, you know, sin has pleasure for a season, but there's also coming a payday. Right, I read to you, and I quoted to you out of Romans uh, 6 23 for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So the wages are going to come. You might enjoy that sin, you might enjoy that illicit sex or porn or whatever you're into, but sooner or later, payday is going to come. And then God's going to require you to give an account. And if you die in this side of life for your sin, you've already made your choice. There's no hope for you. You can only be saved in your consciousness in this life before the grave. There's no purgatory, like Catholic said, it's easy to go in and pay so much amount of money, you know, get your sins, uh, you know, it's not going to happen. That's religion again, folks. That's man's way, not God. All right. Now verse 12. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, in other words, give you understanding of it, working death in me by that which is good, that sin, by the commandment, might become exceedingly sinful. Let me show you how degraded it is and horrible. God can't even look at sin. That's why he has to look through his son Jesus at you and I. He can't look upon sin. But when we're in Christ and we've been made righteous, the righteous of God. So God's looking at us, the finished product, in His Son. Amen. Thank God. God already knows the end of every human being on this planet. From beginning to end. I've taught on predestination. That's another subject. I'm not going to twin that today. But there are those that have been the eons of ages before they were ever in their mother's womb. In their hearts and minds did not choose God. Therefore they won't be saved in this life, because they will reject the pleading of the Holy Spirit and they will pull away from God and probably even enter into blasphemy. That's sad. Now, I'm not teaching Calvinism there. Calvinism teaches that there are certain people that never ever would be saved. You see, that would make John 3.16 not correct. That's why Calvinism is wrong. John 3.16 For God so loved the world all the people in the world that he gave his only begotten son here that whosoever there's the word believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. See that word whosoever. But the whosoever was determined way back before the foundation of the world and in Christ and his heart and mind. We chose. God chose us first, but we have to choose him back. Many are called but few are chosen. Now, verse 14, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, in other words, fleshly, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. Other the things he wants to do, he doesn't do. But what I hate, that do I. In other words, the things he hates the most is sin, he winds up sinning. See the struggle there? That's the struggle of the flesh. Now verse 16, If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. That's for just giving up. Like people with a cigarette habit, they just keep going on. Well, that's all right. God understands. He loves me. I'm just going to go on with this habit because I can't, can't beat it. Well, they're weak willed. See, they're not allowing the Lord to give them the strength. you got to fight. There's a fight of faith. you got to fight things in your mind. You can't just think God's going to come down and knock those cigarettes out of your mouth and out of your teeth or knock that alcohol bottle out of your it doesn't work that way. God helps us as we lean towards Him and believe Him and trust Him. Now, verse 17, Now then it's no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. In other words, sin has taken over. Like the uh, addiction, or excuse me, temptation is not sin. But it's when you yield to that temptation, like it does over in James, let no man say that he's tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempt he any man with evil, but we are tempted when we are drawn away of our own lust. See, that's when it becomes sin, conceived as sin. 
Most I put the word deceive there. It takes birth in you. It becomes sin in your heart. Alright. Now verse 18. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good I find not. In other words, he's saying I can't get the victory over this. I'll try and try. For the good that I would I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I wind up doing. That means that I do. Now verse 20. Now if I do that I would not, then it's no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. So right there what I was talking about earlier, examine yourself. Because if you're uh, committing a sin in a habitual manner every day, something seriously wrong there. And if you're born in the Spirit, you're going to start taking victory. All things are going to become new. And the very next word or verse, 18 says, and all things are of God. In other words, you're going to be going towards God. If you once hung out in the bars, you're probably going to be going towards church. There'll be a big difference in your life. Amen? Praise the Lord. In other words, your, your pattern, your going and coming and all that, your mouth is going to change too. One of the first things that God begins to deal with is our tongue. Your James says the tongue is unruly, a small member, but it's set on fire of hell. And no man can tame the tongue, but Christ is the tongue. But then once Christ has given you the ability and power to tame that tongue, then you can begin to control the whole body. You know, the dictates of the flesh and all that stuff. You see, that's walking in the spirit. That's what it means to walk in the spirit. You start getting the victory over the sin nature that has already been crucified in Christ as you receive Jesus. You were crucified with him at Calvary. Amen. All right. Now, if I do that, I would. There's no more that I do it, but sin is well done. Verse 21, I find in a law that when I do good, evil is present with me. There's that law again revealing the evil. The word of God reveals the evil. Because once we do something that's contrary to this word, it's going to be like alarm bells going off in our spirit. And the Holy Spirit will convict us of sin. He doesn't condemn us. Our flesh is what condemns us. And Satan is the condemner. Amen? Not God. God will convict and reprove us. And that means bring correction to his word. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. That's the spirit man with the heart and the son. But I see another law in my member warring against the law of my mind. You see? Well, that proves in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 again, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. We have to get that renewed mind. That's Romans 12, 2 again. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may be able to prove what is that good, and acceptable, and perfect will of God. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. He says, you see this member, this law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity again to the law of sin, which is in my member. Again, so allowing those members to do things that are not uh, obedient to God, contrary to the word. Now verse 24. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind... I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. And what that means, basically, you keep that body under subjection, you keep it crucified, keep that old thing in that. And your mind is being renewed to the, by the word of God to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God in your life. Amen? I want to read two more passages here out of chapter 8, because I don't want to leave us hanging out there with the struggle. I want to show you the delivery. Now. Chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation, that means judgment as well, to them which are in Christ Jesus, see that in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Okay? Now look at verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So what's it do? It sets you free from the law of sin and death. Praise God. But that's if you walk in the Spirit and after the Word. So the moment we step out of the Spirit to try to yield, lean towards this flesh again, or towards an ungodly thought, 
that's going to lead us back into captivity and bondage. Amen. I hope I've helped you today with this message and helped you to understand how to defeat this struggle. Now, we're going to have this struggle, though, all the way through our life. There's going to be some sort of, if you get the victory in one area, then there's still other areas that we have to deal with. And Satan's always looking for those weak areas in our life. He's always looking for that weak link in the chain where he can break you down. He's a master at that. He's a master at lying and deceiving. And he'll even go as far as to tell you that, you know, you're not saved. But you know that's a lie. But your heart bears witness. It says our spirit, man, bears witness with his spirit that we are the sons of God and we are the children. If we have truly believed in our heart, like Romans 10, 9, and 10 says, verse 9 says, If you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Not maybe. You shall be saved. Now look at verse 10. For with the heart of the spirit, man, man believeth unto righteousness and confession to our mouth confessing the salvation is made unto perfect salvation in Jesus so there you have it you confess him with your mouth and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead but then you become a witness and tell others there's a confirmation through your confession that you're a child of God we're not ashamed of the gospel of God says in Paul 31 Romans 1 16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it's the power of God unto salvation unto everyone that believes. To the Jew first and then to the Greek. Well, brother and sisters, I hope I've helped you and, and I just hope you're having a beautiful day in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you have any questions concerning this message, feel free to email me at redstuck at yahoo.com. Amen. Or you can even call me by phone. I'll talk to you over the phone. And my number is 812-533-9484. I love you all, and God bless you. And if you, if you, for the days out, if you haven't received Jesus, bow your head and confess your sins. Say, Lord, I'm a sinner. Come into my heart. Give me this eternal life that Brother Fred has talked about. And I repent of my sins, Father. And I give you all of my life in the name of Jesus. And you will come in give you eternal life. If you do that, I would happily love to rejoice with you. Just send you materials and whatever you may need to help you in your new walk with the Lord. God bless you and have a glorious, wonderful day. Jesus.